Another way to find the distance to stars is to use what are called Cepheid variables. These are stars that actually, they vary regularly in size and luminosity. So for example, this is a star right here uh, called V1, uh, and it's in the Andromeda galaxy. This is an example of one of these variables here. So this is actually V1, it was actually a, a really important star that was used um, because it turns out Hubble used it to be able to tell the distance accurately. And once you knew the distance, they could tell that ah, these stars are not in our own galaxy. Because for a while, people actually thought all the stars, all the things you saw were in our own you know, neighborhood, in our own galaxy. They called them island universes. But it turned out this was one of the things that actually helped to prove that there, there do exist galaxies. So this was a way to prove it because this thing was so far away. So you can see it's, uh, depending on the date right here, this star actually varies in luminosity. It turns out it literally varies in size. The mechanism behind it is a little bit weird. We don't have to go into the details of it, but I think it's really interesting. It literally changes sizes. Uh, it's something called an Eddington valve. Um, there's also some words uh, you might want to look up, like uh, what's it called, a uh, kappa um, mechanism so those are some different words that sort of are used to describe the motion and, and but we don't have to go into so much detail the key thing for the ib especially is to just know how do you actually do it so what you do is you look at i know this graph right here shows apparent magnitude but that could also be because that's on a scale that a lot of astronomers use i want to use real data here uh, so instead let's actually call this apparent brightness that could be the same thing so don't worry about the scale too much. Basically, it just goes up, then goes down, and goes up, goes down. It's periodic. And if you can find the period of it, you can find, you know, how long is it from a peak to a peak or a trough to a trough or whatever. In this case, let's just say that one was 5.4 days. What you can do then is you can look up, turns out, um, see feed variables act as a standard candle. Remember I explained how the difficulty in astronomy is that so many different stars have different luminosities. So because of that, getting their luminosity is really hard. But turns out Cepheid variables are kind of magical in a sense. First of all, they're named because um, the first one was found on the constellation Cepheus. So that's just why they call it Cepheid. Um, but it turns out the luminosity is related to the period. In other words, the time it takes for it to repeat that cycle is related to its maximum uh, or that, that luminosity. So that maximum luminosity. Um, and that's what's important. So from there, if you can get its apparent brightness and its luminosity, remember, that's the key, right? If you know apparent brightness and luminosity, then you can use the nice simple equation. Now, what's that equation? Hopefully you already know it almost by heart now, but it goes B equals L over four pi D squared, where D is gonna be in meters. So remember, it's easy to measure apparent brightness. You know, we can measure that peak apparent brightness, for example, because ah, that's whatever number of uh, watts per meter squared. So we would know B. But then we have to match that. We have to somehow magically find that. And how do we do it? Well, there's a relation that relates the luminosity and the period. Turns out, depending on the period, we can find the luminosity. So step one is to measure the period of the star. That you can get easily because that's the apparent brightness. Then you use this clever relation right here that says that, ah, once you know the period, let's just say you knew it was, I don't know, whatever value, let's just say, um, I don't know, let's just say it was right here. Uh, then what you can do is just match that over to over here and say, ah, that's what its luminosity is. See that? So the period tells you the luminosity because you get the period luminosity here. Once you know luminosity, then you can find the distance. That's how you do it. It's really actually pretty awesome. This is a good way to tell things that are further out. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of other methods. Um, another method, actually, this again, we go into a lot more detail for it in a higher level. But it's a good idea to know about these. So um, to go even further out, the problem is things are so dim because they're so far away that the light is really, really faint. So we don't see much. The apparent brightness is so small. So we need a really bright event in order for us to even see it. So, for example, in a distant galaxy, if we can see a supernova happening, which is when a star blows up, uh, then we can do something really cool about it. Turns out there's a certain type called a type 1a supernova. In HL, we go over detail what the different types are, but turns out um, there's different types of supernova. One's called a core collapse, where it's just a really super duper massive star. It sort of collapses on its own. Remember, I talked about neutron stars before. So if it actually becomes a neutron star, the material will bounce out and blow up, basically. Uh, those, unfortunately, though, we don't really know the mass of those. But it turns out, if we know the exact mass of the star, then we can tell. It turns out this is a type of uh, supernova, um, and it's caused by what we call a vampire star. 
So what happens is this, you have a binary system. Remember binary means two stars? Imagine one of them is a white dwarf. In other words, it already sort of died, it's already done. It had a white dwarf, which meant its mass was less than the Chandrasekhar limit. Whoops. Remember the Chandrasekhar limit was 1.4 solar masses. So its remnant mass was this. It was less than that. It was a little crappy white dwarf and it sort of died. But its neighboring star, maybe it's like a red giant, so it's sort of puffy, and some of that material is close enough to where it actually sort of goes off to the white dwarf. So the white dwarf accretes, in other words, it sort of gains, it steals the material. That's why it's called a vampire star, because it steals some of the material from the companion star. What if it gets enough material to where it becomes equal to 1.4? solar masses. Remember, then it increases uh, beyond uh, what's called the Chandrasekhar limit. And remember, that was the limit of a white dwarf. In other words, it can no longer be a white dwarf, which means it's going to go supernova and explode. But it turns out the magical part is that because of that, we knew its mass, though. We know that its mass is equal to 1.4. It's exactly equal to this. See core collapse ones, like the really super massive ones, all we know is they're bigger than 1.4. This one, however, we know it's equal to because it didn't have that mass and then it gained it. Turns out from its spectrum, we can tell what kind of um, uh, supernova it is. So if we see one of these, they're called type 1a supernova, turns out it's not the luminosity itself, not the peak, but it turns out the shape of the luminosity curve. In other words, we have this little curve right here. This is an example. Uh, this is a pinwheel galaxy, and this right here was a supernova called SN 2011 FE. Guess what the 2011 means? It tells you the year. So this is a supernova found in 2011, so 2011, uh, in the pinwheel galaxy. And can you see how bright it is compared to the rest of the galaxy? It's crazy bright. And here's the real graph of it. So this is the log, of course, but it's still uh, using luminosity and time. And it turns out it's not exactly the peak luminosity. It's not, it turns out it's the shape. But what we can do is we can match the shape of the luminosity curve, and from that, we can find L. And why does it help to know L? Because now, once we know L, we can use that equation again, remember? 4 pi d squared. So once we know L, then we can find D. So that's how we can do this. So these are kind of, these are really interesting. So again, these are standard candles. Remember, a standard candle means some way of determining the luminosity, some way of standardizing them. Here's another example of one. It's a galaxy called a cigar galaxy. Uh, it's called M82. Um, and it turns out this one right here is uh, 2014. So you can see the actual, if you zoom in on it, so there was the actual supernova. It lasts some days. So that's really interesting, I think. This is a way to get the distances. Now let's actually do a real example. Um, and at least at the time that I record this, this is fairly new. This is a, um, they're doing big searches uh, for exoplanets. These are planets around other stars. What we can do is we can watch the stars really carefully without blinking, basically. Um, one of the telescopes used was called Kepler. That's one that we put into space. It follows the Earth uh, around an orbit around the sun, and it was staring at a few hundred thousand stars without ever blinking, just sort of watching them. What we do is we hope that a planet passes in front of the star called a transit. And if it passes in front of the star, we hope to see the star's light dim a little bit, and it'd be periodic. Turns out if you can see three or four of these things happening, then you can determine it wasn't just a weird thing in the star, it's actually a planet. So this is one famous one, at least at the time that I record these, um, called TRAPPIST-1. Now we know it's a red dwarf, which means it's a tiny little red star. That means it can be really old, it'll last kind of forever, but it has seven planets already orbiting it. So we've already detected seven at the time that I record this. Now the star has a parallax angle of 0.08 arc seconds. So the question is, how long would it take for radio signals sent from Earth to reach one of the planets? In other words, what if there's an alien sitting on one of those planets? How long would it take for us to basically say, hello? Obviously that part we don't know. We know that there's planets, that's all we know. We don't know that there's aliens on there, right? But Let's just take it a little step further and have some fun. But this is, so this is its parallax angle. So what we can do then is we can just use this really simple idea about parallax angle. Remember that from back here? If we can find the parallax angle, we can find the distance. So D is 1 over P, where the parallax angle has to be in arc seconds and the distance is in parsecs. And remember there's 3.26 light years in a parsec. These are on your data booklets, so you don't have to memorize them. So if we do that, then we can just say, ah, it's really easy then. I hope you can see that. Let's write down the equation that we use. So d is 1 over p. Um, therefore, the distance is going to be 1 over the parallax angle, which is 0 
Well, let me just do that on my trusted calculator, 1 over 0 0.08. Now I get an answer of 12.5. What are the units though, do you remember? It's measured in parsec. Now the problem is that doesn't answer my question. Maybe I can convert this to light years instead. So it turns out, remember if I got parsecs on the top, I want parsec on the bottom to cancel them out. And I know a conversion. I know that there are 3.26 light years for every one parsec. If I do it like this, that means I'll multiply and I'll get my answer in light years. So I do this answer times 3.26 and I end up with 40.75 light years away. Now, this was a slightly different type of question, but it's still related to this because how long would it take for a radio signal? Radio signal is light. And if this is a distance of 40, let's just say or 41, let's say, light years away, what it means is it'll take light 41 years to get there, which means that's actually our answer. It turns out the time then would be 41 years. Because if it's 41 light years away, radio signals are just light. It'll take light literally 41 years to get there. So this is answering that question. So that means if we want to talk to any aliens that may be living on one of those planets around TRAPPIST-1, it'll take us 41 years to send out signals. In other words, we can say like, hello, how are you doing? And we have to wait 41 years for them to receive it. And assuming they receive it and there's aliens there who feel like talking to us, they could send us back a signal and say, fine, how are you? They see that it'll be a really long time. So if nothing else, it'll be slow if there's anybody there. So trust me, we're watching and listening uh, around those different exoplanet uh, stars. So TRAPPIST-1 is a really interesting one to look at. But I hope that explains that you, know, you can still do really interesting uh, astrophysics, but still related to IB questions.